Stalin's Mischance is a study by Russian military historian Mikhail Melchukhov that covers the theory of a planned Soviet invasion first raised by an ex-Soviet spy named Viktor Suvorov. Unlike the work of Suvorov, Melchukhov's book is based on archive material, some of which was until recently classified. They both agreed that Stalin prepared an offensive for the summer of 1941. But there are two points where they disagree. In this video, you will discover the content of these archives and the nature of their disagreement. But there are two things to understand before we start. First of all, we should abandon the fantasy of a certain pathological peacefulness of the USSR, inspired by Soviet propaganda. In principle, we should recognize that the Soviet Union also had its own interests, but usually they were spoken about so vaguely that it is almost impossible to fully understand the real intentions of Soviet foreign policy. And second, the content of Soviet military plans is traditionally described in Russian literature according to a well-established scheme. Plans were developed only in response to the growth of the German threat. However, archives that became available in the early 1990s and research in recent years dismantle this approach. It became known that the Soviets planned military operations against Germany starting in October 1939 and continued until Operation Barbarossa. Russian historian Mark Solonin stated that during this period five plans of a war with Germany were established and all of them were about an offensive of the Red Army into Germany. For Soviet strategists, there were two military political blocs that emerged in Europe in 1939, the Anglo-French and the German-Italian alliances. Both were interested in an agreement with the USSR. The spring of 1939 even saw the formation of the Anglo-French-Polish coalition. After negotiations between the Soviet Union and the Anglo-French bloc, it became evident that Britain and France were not ready for an equal partnership with the Soviet Union. Under these conditions, Germany's proposal turned out to be more attractive and on the 23rd of August 1939, a Soviet-German non-aggression pact was signed in Moscow, which became a significant success for Soviet diplomacy. The USSR managed to stay out of the European war while gaining a significant free hand in Eastern Europe, but everyone knew that war was looming. On September 17, 1939, the USSR invaded Poland, marking its official entry into World War II as an independent military political force which was still more loyal to Germany. It was just the beginning of Moscow's attempts to push beyond its borders. In the summer of 1940, it annexed the Baltic states. Meanwhile, the Red Army failed against Finland, which maintained its independence. And in the second half of June 1940, the Soviets occupied Bessarabia. By November 1940, it became clear that the last obstacle from Soviet penetration into Europe was Germany. Soviet-German relations then entered a new stage, the direct preparation for war. Soviet intelligence possessed many valuable information about Germany's intentions and about the preparation of an attack against the Soviet Union. But the way Germany destroyed the Dutch, Belgium, French and part of the British armies within a month made the Soviets very nervous. Between February and March 1941, Soviet intelligence correctly identified German troop transfers to the east. However, the estimates of the German armed forces were overestimated and the recent German invasion of Scandinavia and Western Europe contributed to their further increase. For example, at the end of 1938, according to Soviet intelligence, the Wehrmacht had 7,300 tanks and 5,160 aircraft, when in fact, on September 1st, 1931. Eight months later, the German armed forces numbered 3,474 tanks and 4,288 aircraft. As time passed, these overestimates constantly increased. So, according to subsequent estimates, 
The Luftwaffe reached 6,000 aircraft by October 1939, although in reality it numbered only 4,756 aircraft. Following these trends, as of March 1, 1941, it was estimated that the Wehrmacht had 8 million soldiers, 11,000 tanks, 52,000 artillery guns, and close to 21,000 aircraft. In fact, the Wehrmacht numbered just below 7 million people, 5,000 tanks, 33,000 guns, and 5,259 aircraft. On June 1, 1941, the Soviets believed that only 41% of German divisions were concentrated in the East and 42% against Britain. Based on these indications, no one in Moscow could conclude with certainty that the preparations for an attack on the USSR were completed. In reality, 62% of the Wehrmacht divisions had been deployed against the USSR. In other words, Soviet intelligence failed to reliably establish the composition of the German armed forces and their grouping in the East, which made it difficult to assess any possible threat to the Soviet Union. In turn, the Soviet leadership did not fear an imminent German attack, believing that Germany, bound by a war with Britain, would continue its offensive in the Middle East or try to land on the British islands. Stalin even claimed that it would be very foolish of Hitler to start a war on two fronts. Since neither Germany nor the USSR counted on an enemy attack in the summer of 1941, it contradicts Suvorov's theory of a preventive assault by Germany with Operation Barbarossa. But now, let's dig into the core of the study. The main idea of Soviet military planning was that for the Red Army, under the cover of troops deployed on the western border districts, to launch a sudden decisive offensive against southern Poland. For six months, the Soviet general staff was engaged in resolving the issue of the most advantageous direction of concentration of the main efforts of the troops in the war with Germany. Since Soviet military science paid exceptionally great attention to the correct choice of the direction of the main strike to take full account of political, economic, military and geographical factors. The first half of 1941 was devoted to thoroughly practicing the strike. The troops purposefully worked out offensive plans, trained to conduct mobile offensive actions. Unfortunately, the operational plans of the districts still remain inaccessible to researchers, which makes it impossible to get the full picture of the operational plans of the Soviet military leadership in details. Suvorov explains how Stalin took great attention to conceal a mass mobilization by manipulating the laws setting the conscription age. That allowed Stalin to provide the expensive buildup of the Red Army. Since there was no universal military draft in the Soviet Union until 1939, by enacting the universal military draft on September 1st, 1931, and by changing the minimum age for joining the Red Army from 21 to 18, Stalin triggered a mechanism which achieved a dramatic increase in the military strength of the Red Army. According to him, the specific law on mobilization allowed the Red Army to increase its military from 1.8 million in 1939 to 5 million in the spring of 1941 under secrecy to avoid alarming the rest of the world. Meanwhile, 18 million reservists were also drafted. But going back to the archives, Melchukhov identified the four main points for the rapid mobilization of the Red Army. Number one, to carry out a hidden mobilization of troops under the guise of reserve training. Number two, under the guise of training, carry out a concealed concentration of armies close to the western border. Number three, covertly concentrate airfields from remote districts to the western border. And number four, gradually, again under the guise of training camps and logistical exercises, deploy the logistical and hospital bases near the western border. According to the archives, the troops of the 21st Army were to complete concentration by July 2nd, the 22nd Army by July 3rd, the 20th Army by July 5th, 
19th Army by July 7th, the 1st, 16th, 24th and 28th Armies by July 10th. By July 5th, the setup of airfields 500 km from the border were to be completed. By July 15th, it was planned to complete the construction of air defense facilities in Kiev and camouflage warehouses, workshops and other military facilities in the border area as well as supply all available weapons to the border. If we follow these elements, the Red Army was supposed to complete preparations for the offensive no earlier than July 15, 1941. This is the second point where Melchukhov and Suvorov disagree as Suvorov claimed the Soviet invasion was planned for the 23rd of June, one day exactly before Operation Barbarossa. It is also important to note that Soviet military capabilities in June 1941 were not as inferior to the Germans as it is often portrayed. The Wehrmacht still mainly relied on horses. During Operation Barbarossa, they used between 600 and 750,000 horses and by 1943, the German army was still 80% horse-drawn. Meanwhile, the Soviets had achieved almost full mechanization by 1941. Melchikov continues by saying that all available material allows us to make an assumption about the sequence of the final preparations of the Soviet troops for war. Most likely, on July 1st, 1941, the troops of the Western districts would have received an order to put into effect the cover plans and the completion by July 15th of the deployment of the planned Red Army grouping in the Western theater of operations, which would have allowed the USSR at any time after this date to begin hostilities against Germany. However, the impossibility of completely keeping the Soviet military preparation secret did not allow the strike on Germany to be postponed for a long time, otherwise the Germans would have learned about it eventually. Therefore, the completion of the concentration and deployment of the Red Army on the western border should have served as a signal for an immediate attack on Germany. Only in this case would it be possible to keep this preparation secret and to take the enemy by surprise. By concentrating such a large grouping of troops near the Soviet borders, the German command waged a massive disinformation campaign to mask its intentions. This made it possible to achieve a surprise attack and having tricked the vigilance of the Soviet leadership. If the Soviets were indeed planning a provocation, it would explain why Stalin, in the first hours of the German invasion, frantically demanded not to respond to any provocations. Stalin's very unusual actions during the last days before the German attack can also be explained as he was concentrated on realizing his massive offensive and ignored all warnings from intelligence as distraction and misinformation. When he faced the reality of the German attack on the 22nd of June 1941, it took many hours for Stalin to realize what was really going on. Hitler had beaten him by three weeks. He was shocked and confused, resulting in ineffective orders and panic among the high command. Stalin then retreated to his villa outside Moscow and remained there out of contact to comprehend the situation.